Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come dies. back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come back, Mother? Today, Nearly 40 years ago, it was Christmas, just like it's Christmas today, but it is different. Then there were people and lights and drinking and dancing and flirting, but now I find myself alone. It's Christmas Eve and the cat is out. Perhaps he has a party to go to. More faithful, the dog curls by the fire where heaped coals burn orange and black with blue and yellow flames fluttering softly around them. Looking at coals like that reminds me of the tales my grandfather told me to while away the time when I was young. That's sixty years since. And I still miss him. There was so much time then. There isn't so much left anymore, but that's all right. I'm comfortable with the fire and the dog and await the return of my black cat Lucifer, from his night on the tiles. I was an orphan. A banal traffic accident killed my parents on the minor road where it kinks between the trees on the sinuous way from Rottington to Sanath. But forty years ago, I was going out with Meyer. Meyer wasn't Welsh. She was born in Surrey, but her father was from North Pembrokeshire, hence her name. As noted, I had no parents of my own, but probably because of this, Maya's mother and father adopted me for the three years we were together, and I spent Christmas at theirs each holiday. This was the first, 1982. That day, Maya and I had been shopping in Farnham and seen that affluent Surrey town dressed up for the season, coloured lights on strings across the street, a tree big and twinkling with baubles and all-weather fairy lights, and in front of that a crib and a Salvation Army band and carol singers shaking tins for donations and swarms of shoppers keen to be finished shopping, still anxious about the presents they'd bought and stressed about the presents they had yet to buy, but excited too by the air and the chill and the season and the scent of cloves and chestnuts, just like I was. As we strolled in the crisp air, I noticed Meyer wasn't speaking to me. Her displeasure was easy to overlook in the merry crowds. That night there would be parties and warmth and sparkle, and the girls would wear glittery dresses and the women in brocaded gowns and the purple-rinsed old ladies in care homes would sport a sprig of holly in their hair and tie tinsel-like bangles round their wrists and sip a sherry to remember their long-gone lovers. That's how it was then. But as I said, Meyer wasn't speaking to me. I didn't know why, and I couldn't figure it out, and of course I didn't ask because she would tell me I should know why. And she was beautiful, and dark-haired and dark-eyed and brooding and annoyed, and I loved her. But this is not a story about the ghost of my love for Meyer. That love is long dead. Reading the situation as we entered the kitchen, Maya's mother offered me a mince pie, and her dad, Tom, being Tom, handed me a glass of red wine. Tom and Anne are long dead too. But this is not a ghost story about them. This is a ghost story about time. And about me. Remember, 40 years ago, and Maya is still in a mood... But I don't mind, because I've already worked out over the past months we've been together, that her moods vanish like the morning mist, and maybe tonight, or perhaps tomorrow, the reason she is upset with me will be forgotten and forgiven. One day it won't be, but that isn't yet. So we're sitting around their long oak table in the kitchen by the Arga, and Tom has opened another bottle of wine, which is only fair as he drank most of the first one. Anne is sipping black tea and smoking her slim cheroots and talking. She isn't from where we are, but let her tell the tale. She says, You know, we moved into this house when my father came back from Ceylon, or Sri Lanka, I should say. The area was much quieter then, of course. The house dated from the 1930s and was probably pretty pricey, though I didn't realise that then. It stood with a large garden in woodland on the edge of Yateley Common, a large area of heath and scrub woodland protected under Greenbelt legislation. 
You just walked onto the heath down an unmade road, and when you were there, it was a wilderness, as it had been centuries ago before the urbanisation of this part of the home counties, when local people talked with a country burr rather than an estuary and drawl. And, though I'm not from here, I always loved the area, said Anne. She drew on her cheroot and tapped it on the blue Chinese bowl with a fish design she used as an ashtray. People think Surrey is soulless, but it isn't by long chalk. It's full of history and myth, same as anywhere, just buried now under middle-class aspiration. The heath here has its legends, you know, Tom said. They wouldn't let you build this house where it is today, you know. Anne turned to him. Before my father had it built, this was just woodland. And do you know what, Mark? Oh, by the way, would you like another mince pie? I would, and Tom took the opportunity to fill my wine glass. Another bottle, I should say, he muttered. Rioja, all right? Anne said, as I was saying, there was a legend that this area was under the sway of the fairies. Shh, Tom said, raising the index finger of his left hand to bar his lips. Don't mention the fair folk. You never know what'll happen if you get their attention. You just did mention them, Dad, said Sulky Meyer. He shrugged and went to fetch more wine. Anne continued. So, the good neighbours, as they call them, linger here. They also call them Pharisees round here, the old local folk do. Funny. Pharisees, like in the Bible. Tom had sat, poured, and was half listening. Not that kind of Pharisee at all. Don't know why they call him it. Shh, Tom, I was saying. So, Mark, I never saw anything here. But my mother did. She swore they came into the house. My father never admitted he saw anything, but he would always go on about things being moved. Tom said, That was your mother, dear. Charming woman, but quite batty. Meyer snapped, That's my grandmother you're talking about. Tom sipped his wine, leaving his lips crimson. Lovely woman. Of course, being Welsh, we have a remarkable stock of fairy law, or, as we call them, the Tulwith Teg. Anne sat forward. Do you believe in fairies, Mark? I grimaced. Well, no, not really. Tom said, he's all about money, that boy, not a sensitive bone in his body. Dad, Meyer said. I sat back. She'd stuck up for me. She must be coming round. Well, I mean... Economics, wasn't it, you studied? At where? Preston? Anne said, you're being rude, Tom. You've had too much to drink. But later, we all went to the cricketers and drank some more, and I couldn't keep up with them. They were good at drinking. So when it was my round, I bought myself shandy and told no one what it was. We got back to the house on the heath around 10pm. Tom had put Radio 4 on the car radio as he drove us home. Yes, people drove after drinking in those days. My father did too. Radio 4 was playing a ghost story for Christmas, one by M. R. James. I always liked ghost stories, but I was more afraid that Tom would fall asleep at the wheel than the descriptions of haunted places and weird bedsheets on the radio. It was only about a mile, thank God, and the story seemed to keep him awake rather than otherwise, though it had sent both Anne and Meyer to doze. He parked, Meyer woke, clicked open the car door, she still was only muttering enough to tell me she was going to bed. I wasn't ready for bed, so sat up with Tom, who told me his views on northerners and how they were all right, but not as good as the Welsh. I suppose that was progress. He asked me again, What did you study? He'd clearly forgotten the chat where he'd said that I was all about money, but he would remember shortly and probably say it all again. Tom was an aeronautical engineer, and worked at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough doing something secret. I said, economics. Ah, all about money, eh? Engineering is a proper pursuit for a man. I told you I'm an engineer, yes? Uh, yes, I frowned. Several times, in fact, but it's not polite to bring that up. I pursed my lips. Then he ever so gently fell asleep in his chair. I sat in the soft blaze of the Christmas tree. Anne had made it beautiful, hung it with tinsel, sparkled it with lights, put a fairy on the top, who in her turn had been dusted in glitter in some factory in China. But it glistered and glimmered so adroitly that you could forgive the excesses of capitalism and environmental degradation. 
sitting there nicely warm with wine I could anyway. I wondered whether they believed in fairies in China. It was quiet sitting there. The old grandfather clock that stood in the corner ticked, the filigreed iron fingers pointing out an enameled circle of eternity, as they'd done since the clock was made in 1812. The ticking of the clock, and the sound of Tom snoring, and the wind buffeting and murmuring and rising and falling kept me company. Christmas Eve. It was 1982. Did I say that? And suddenly I felt something. Goosebumps stood up on my arms and I felt the hair rise on my neck. Someone had entered the room. Smile. I wondered if she crept down to make up with me. No answer. Slowly I turned my head. The tinsel fluttered on the tree. A draught entered, getting in under the door, made restless by the wind outside. A breath of winter from the cold heath and waiting trees. But there was no one in the room, just the inhalation of the season, betrayed only by the movement of the tinsel, and a touch of cold on my cheek like a frigid kiss. The word spirit derives from the word for breath, the inspiration of air. No one was there. No one could be there. No strangers could get into the house, under the door, round the window panes, even down the chimney. The house was secure from all human intruders. And then I thought of Pharisees. Maybe it was one of them. Is there anyone there? I whispered, though I expected no answer. I said it in fun, just in honour of Christmas Eve, when there might be magic after all, even though we struggle to find it now, not like when we were children, when magic was like jewels in our hands. No one answered. Thought not, I said. And then I heard a voice whisper. Yes. And then I slept, like Tom, the two of us gently snoring in our chairs. I dreamed. In the dream, there was an old man in the room with Tom and I, a little wizened old man, one of the Pharisees. He held an oval mirror in a chipped gilt frame, a mirror whose silver was black in parts and trailed with marks like cobwebs. The Pharisee didn't speak. He grinned. He winked. He pointed at the quicksilver mirror of what was, what might be, and what could never happen again. And I fell in. I was a small boy again, by the Christmas tree, in the house in Harrington. This would be 1969. It was an artificial tree, all silver, because my mother said actual trees shed their needles, and she was there, my long-dead mother. I watched this scene as if it was TV, my mother hanging baubles, giving them to me so I could string the metallic glass balls on the lower branches of our silver, magic-haunted, cheap tinsel tree. And she said, there, Mark, now get the mouse. And I went to the cardboard box that I'd completely forgotten about until I saw it, memories flooding back. This was the box where my mother kept the decorations from year to year, and every Christmas we found it under the eaves and took them out one by one and hung them on the tree. And one of my favourites was a mouse with a sword. I don't know where that box is now. And there I was, with my mother, like it was still 1969. Not 1982, not 2022. And at that moment, and in this moment, I knew I existed in all three. Who I am splintered in every memory, like a reflection in a Christmas bauble. And she pulled me in and stroked the top of my head, and she kissed me. And she is dead. Time itself remembers us. And then 1969 faded, and I dozed in a seat in a room in 1982, and a Pharisee stood with his mirror. And then the quicksilver vision changed, and another scene assembled itself, until it too 
stood ready to be seen. This one was darker. An old man sat in an armchair in front of a fire. The room was familiar, and I realised it was the room I am sitting in while I write this story in 2022. But it isn't 2022 in the vision. The black cat Lucifer is older, grey around his whiskers, and my beloved dog is gone. And so the cat and I sit alone on Christmas Eve. In the vision I look like Father Christmas, my beard longer and whiter, my face more lined. By my side on the table, a different one to this that sits here while I write this, is a cut crystal goblet and in it a measure of golden whiskey. And somehow I know it will be Japanese whiskey, Suntory, which I've never tasted yet, but which the Pharisee's vision tells me I will come to love. Christmas cards stand up on the mantelpiece, one from my daughter Elspeth and one from my son Michael. A string of coloured lights twists around the mirror above the fire like a rainbow. A miniature Christmas tree sits at the window bottom. At least I haven't forgotten my love of Christmas trees. I watch as the cat jumps onto the lap of the old man and he strokes its head and it bows and purrs. And time remembers the future me, as well as splinters of the past me, boy and young man. And it remembers how I loved Meyer and my mother, and my children, and my cats and my dogs. We are all held in the mind of time. So this is what the ghost story is about. The past, the present, and the future are all ghosts. Whenever you think you are, you are always. These ghosts of who we were, who we are, and who we will be, are all real. And in some sense, they're all now. And when he saw me understand this, the little man, the Pharisee, bowed. Nothing is lost. And I remember that Christmas Eve, 1982, 40 years ago in Meyer's house, waking and seeing Tom in his seat still asleep. I rise quietly from my chair, I salute the grandfather clock, the faithful servant of time, whose fingers tell me it is just before midnight and soon will be Christmas Day. I make my way from the front room with the Christmas tree and the clock and snoring Tom Hughes, heading for my borrowed bedroom. On the landing, I remember. I hesitate, but then quietly step over to Meyer's door. I turn the handle, push it down, and there she is, lying in bed, duvet up, mad at me, her black hair spilled over the pillow. She hears, stirs sleepily and sits up. I don't love Meyer anymore, but I loved her then. She says, still grumpy, what do you want? And I just kissed her. If you like that story, consider supporting me as a patron. That way you help me make more stories for you and get access to a patrons-only library of stories. Lots more hours for you to listen to. So that was the ghost of Christmas passed by me, Tony Walker. And I must admit, I'm always um, less nervous reading other people's stuff. I can read, you know, Neil um, Gaiman or Charles Dickens or somebody like that. And, it, and Stephen King, and if people don't like them, well, okay, you don't like them. But if it's my stuff and you're thinking, oh, that was rubbish. That, that's, that's, it's, it's a bit more jittery anyway. We've done it. Um, it isn't Christmas when I'm doing this. It's not far off, but that's the whole point, isn't it? And I think Christmas in the, in the Northern Hemisphere is that darkest time of the year. Is, and there's, it's no surprise, lots of light festivals, the Christian Christmas, but also the pagan Yule and the Jewish Hanukkah, uh, just before we've had uh, the Hindu D Diwali and... Uh, so there are lots of, and there will be other ones I don't know about. So it's about a time when we're deep, deep in the dark dreaming of the year. And I think magic comes more easily then. And what I mean by magic is a step away from the everyday. So we can get so lost in the everyday world that we think that's all that there is. And we forget that we, we're not just bits. And, you know, that's my belief. If you believe we are just bricks and things and fair enough but clearly I don't and 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 fundamentally uh, this is 
my deep belief about time, about how nothing is lost, and that everything somehow is remembered by, not by the individual perhaps, but by, but by time itself, or whatever you want to call that, that, that intelligence, that knowing. Um, not usually called times, usually called other words, isn't it? Other names, beginning with G. Um, and there you have, I, I'm a theist, I guess. So anyway, um, I want to tell you another story that kind of is a compliment to that one. So my grandmother, Lily, died in 2007 when she was 94. And she was telling me about her one day, not then, but I was looking at some old photographs of hers and there was her as a young woman of about 17. So that would have been about 1920 something. And she was sitting on a stone wall with a, a man with a, a, a flat cap, a working man. And it was her father, Tom Goodfellow. And he was a coal miner. And she looked at that and she said, that's my dad, she said. I loved my dad, she said. And I thought he'd been dead so long, he died in the 1940s. He was, um, I'll tell you the story, Tom Goodfellow then. And it struck me that there I was with my grandmother in her 90th year and she was near the end of her life. And she was surrounded by people who loved her, you know, me and my brother and my cousins and um, my, uh, my mum and my daughters and her great-grandchildren. And yet, when she came into the world in 1912, she was also surrounded by people who love her. And funnily enough, uh, my partner Sheila's son has just had a grandchild, Noah, just born in November this year. And he is surrounded by those who love, but they will not be the same people who love him all their lives. So, so you might say that the people who were with my grandmother when she was born, so that's her dad, Tom, and her mother, Mary Anna, um, and her grandparents and her uh, siblings, you know, they were all gone. So, so isn't that so tragic, you might say? But it seemed to me that, uh, that they were still there in some sense. I strongly feel that. I, don't, I can't explain it, really. Uh, and so I'll tell you about Tom Goodfellow, as we've mentioned him. So my, my great-grandmother, Mary Hannah, uh, came from a, a rather pious family of Methodist working-class coal mining Methodists. They had, they had some farm as well. They, they did bits of things. They had milk, milk cows and all sorts. But uh, they were very respectable, had their own pews at chapel, very devout, God-fearing Christian people. And... Um, my great-grandfather, Tom Goodfellow, the Goodfellows were not as respectable. And so there was a bit of a scandal when she married him. Uh, and he was a coal miner. And so he had a brother, Joseph. And uh, Joseph was an engineer. So he worked on the railways that were with the coal mines. So he was a coal engineer. But Tom, his brother, my great-grandfather, uh, was he dug the coal. You know, he was down at the coal face. And um, anyway, the First World War happened. And because... Joseph, my great great uncle, was a an engineer. He was a volunteer with the, um, the Royal Engineers, the British Army Regiment, and he went to war straight away, and he was killed uh, at Passchendaele. And although my great grandfather Joseph didn't have to volunteer because miners were not forced to sign up, he immediately signed up and went to war. And he uh, ended up at the end of the war in this, something like the Devonshire Regiment, which, and we're like 300 miles from Devonshire, we're Cumberland. But, um, it, it, but I think because the units were so blown about and they lost so many men, they just put people where they could and he ended up in the Devonshire Infantry, Light Infantry, I think. And then he, he'd been gassed and he was never the same man. And he, then they, my great-grandmother had been in service uh, with, the, with the Fletcher family, do you know Mut Mutiny on the Bounty? Not the same ones, but the same family. She was um, in, at Ewanrig Hall, I think, and also Talentire Hall, I think. I heard that. I might not be right about Talentire Hall, but Ewanrig, I think, definitely. And uh, sh so she was used to looking after people. And after the war, the family moved to Blackpool by the sea, and it was a big area where lots of people went, working-class people went to the seaside. And she had a boarding house. And then the Second World War happened, and they were still in Blackpool. And he volunteered as an air raid warden um, so he went around and kept the lights covered and when the, air, the bombers came, German bombers came over, he put the alarm off. 
and then he died in the war, and I'm not sure. He was never very well, you know. And so what's the point of me telling you that story? The point is saying that all these people that we are connected to, I absolutely believe are not lost. Time is not a thing that it's always, just we can't see it. And, but those we love and who love us, including our pets, they're still there. And so that is my firm belief and I want to give it as a Christmas present to you if you will accept it. And if you don't want to accept it, that's fine. No hard feelings. Let's just keep listening to ghost stories. I won't be as profound next time. But it's Christmas, so I'm allowed to. I'm a very sentimental man as well, so there we are. Okay, happy Christmas.